in many ways you could view these pastoral epistles that are written more towards the end of Paul's life and end of his ministry as a summary of some of the life lessons that he's learned over his journey with God, his journey with Jesus. And he's wanting to pass those on to younger leaders such as Timothy and such as Titus. And I think for those of us who are growing a little bit older, maybe as you come to half time or you come to the three quarter time in your life, it's a good thing to reflect back on some of the lessons that we've learned and what are the things that we can also pass on to others. I began that process maybe even over a decade ago of trying to reflect on and write down some of my life lessons and it began with just a few things that I've written down there. Now it's grown to I have 31 different life lessons that I, I'm slowly crafting and journaling and reflecting on and continuing to develop. And I can see that same pattern in Paul's life. And for me, one of those life lessons is uh, just recently I've come to realise this. Enjoy grandparenting. That's a great life lesson for those of you who come to that stage of your life. There's a whole message around that. I might share a little bit about that later on. But uh, another life lesson for me, which is really right back from the very beginning when I first gave my life to Christ and I was baptised in water, is this life lesson of trusting in the faithfulness of God. It's been very real for me right over my whole life life and ministry journey. Another life lesson for me, which is I've journaled about, I've thought about, I've reflected about, is this whole thing of finishing what you started. I think that's a great principle to imply in our life and to finish the things that God's given us to do. In fact, one prayer that I discovered maybe a few years ago, just four years ago, which is from a gentleman called Sir Francis Drake. He was a British sea captain. He was a politician later in the 1500s. He was also a bit of a rogue, so we don't follow everything that he did in his life. But nevertheless, I think it is quite a powerful prayer. And this is my version of it, and it's been quite meaningful to me. O oh Lord God, when you give your servants any great matter to undertake, grant us also a deep heart conviction that it's not the beginning which yields the true glory, but the continuation of the endeavour until it is thoroughly finished. In other words, finish what you started. Then he continues on, through him who laid down his life for us to finish your work, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. And certainly we can look to Jesus as someone who finished what he started, going to the cross and then rising again. But the reality of life is that there are times when we face a blockage or we face a question or we face a problem and it becomes literally impossible to finish what we started. What do you do then? Just uh, a few, maybe four or five weeks ago, my wife and I, after a very busy first quarter, Christine teaching at the school, and myself, a busy start of the year, we decided we wanted a bit of a break right after Easter and we'd booked a cruise from Sydney to go up to the South Pacific. And we flew up to Sydney, we were all ready to go. We went up the night before, we had our reef shoes with us so we could go snorkeling. We had our summer clothes, we had our suntan lotion, our hat and all those types of things. And at 6 a.m. the following day, the day that we were about to embark on the ship, we get an email from the shipping company which says to us, our sincerest apologies, your ship has a technical issue and we will not be able to sail for another three days and neither will we be going to South Pacific, but we're going to go to Hobart. <laughs> I have nothing against Tasmanians. <laughs> but this certainly was a confronting issue. And yes, no matter what we could do, we could not change the outcome of this. We had a goal, we had an aim, we were going to the South Pacific. Now it was not gonna happen. There was nothing we could do. We could not finish what we'd started. It was deeply confronting and it was quite something which we were even a little bit frustrated and angry about. I'll tell you a little bit more about the resolution of that as we continue on. But yes, that may be a lighthearted example, but there are times in our life when there's more serious things come along. And yes, it is quite clear that we're not going to be able to finish what we started. So today, at the beginning of our Dear Church series, which is a set of letters written to, yes, people who are in a pastoral ministry, but there are also principles here that we all can learn on. There's life lessons from Paul that we all can learn on. We're going to look at Paul and we're going to look at some of one of his life lessons, 
And we're gonna ask ourselves the question, what do you do when you can't finish what you started? Now, think about Paul. And we're gonna begin here at the end. My apologies for that, but it's a good principle when you're planning your goals to have the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. So rather than starting in 1 Timothy today, we're going to 2 Timothy. In fact, we're going right to the end of 2 Timothy and we're gonna reflect on one of the last life lessons of Paul as he's facing quite likely in what was the end of his life journey there before he experienced resurrection life in Christ. What is that lesson? Well, I wanna tell you, Paul, like me, was deeply convinced that you should finish what you started. You can see that as you read in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Great scripture here. What does it say? For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. So Paul is aware he's there in Rome in prison, maybe the first or the second time, and he's aware that his departure is coming. That's just a polite way of saying that he knows that he's about to be executed. But what does he say? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Then he continues on to talk about the fact that there's now a crown of righteousness stored up for him and that's a crown which is available to all those who love Jesus appearing. I wanna focus on this phrase though. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Paul, at the end of his life, was convinced that he'd finished what he started. Well, that's the way it would apparently appear. We can also reflect on other times when Paul has been passing on this life lesson to some of the younger leaders who he's mentored and discipled. And we see a similar type of principle that he teaches. For example, Colossians 4 verse 17 tells us quite clearly, he's writing a little bit of an aside to a person we don't know much about. His name is Archippus. And he says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you've received in the Lord. In other words, finish what you started. Even in 2 Timothy there, right before we have that passage about fighting the good fight, finishing the race, keeping the faith, we see an exhortation again to Timothy where he says in 2 Timothy 4, 5, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and discharge all the duties of your ministry. Once again, finish what you started, discharge your duties, complete the journey, finish the task. It was a life principle that Paul wanted to pass on to younger leaders. But there's a paradox here. Because if you reflect on Paul's own life journey, it would appear he did not finish what he planned. He did not finish the journey that he started. How do we know this? You can look at, uh, say, the letter to the Romans. This was a letter that Paul wrote much earlier in the pastoral epistles. And he's writing it to the church in Rome that had already been established. He'd never been there, even though he was a Roman citizen. He'd never actually been to Rome. He'd never actually been there on his journeys, but he wanted to go there. And he'd even felt that the Lord had called him to go there. And he's writing, he's saying to them, I've longed to come and see you. I haven't been able to do that, but I'm gonna keep my promise. I'm gonna be there with you in Rome. But at the end of the book of Romans, we see this interesting thing. His goal was not to go to Rome. His goal was actually go to Spain, which is further on, even beyond Rome. And so he tells us that he plans to come with, go with them and be with them because he's going to use it as a staging post to continue his mission, continue his plan of taking the gospel of the salvation we have in Jesus Christ and the resurrection and life and death of Jesus. And he's going to take that gospel all the way to the farthest stretch of the Roman Empire, all the way to Spain. You see, Paul had a plan. The plan was step by step, very systematic. Here I am, possibly in Ephesus. I'm gonna go to Rome and then I'm gonna continue on and go to Spain. He never got there. He never finished the plan. He never actually ended up. And what what do we do? How do we adapt to that reality that there are so many times in life when there is a goal that we have, but it does, does not become possible and we never actually get there? I wanna suggest to you, that there's a difference between finishing what we started and finishing well. It's still possible to finish well, even if we may not be able to fully finish the things that we planned and the things that we started. And that's what we're gonna reflect on and we're going to look at for the remainder of our time together here. So, how is that possible? I want to share three diagrams with us now to kind of set this up and help us understand this. This is life normally. 
Life normally, and I've shared this in leaders meetings, I've talked to our staff about this, I wanted to share it with you as well. Now this is how we look at life. We make a plan and then we put it into action and then we're gonna achieve the goal that we've set. It's kind of like, here I am in Ephesus, gonna go to Rome, gonna end up in Spain. <laughs> life step like that. That's a kind of a, 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 a very simplistic way of understanding the reality of life. It's never like that. Life's more like this. This is how it kind of normally happens. You make a plan and then in this next diagram, you adjust along the way and you might go this direction, you might go that direction, you might turn this way, you might turn that way, you kind of going this way and you're going that way, you reinvent, you replan, you reflect, you might go backwards sometimes, you end up over here. Anyone ever felt like this? You're going round and round in circles sometimes maybe, and yet you're still pressing towards the goal, you're still pressing on towards, it must take you a whole lot longer than you originally thought. That's reality, isn't it? Anyone experience that? And certainly it was exactly like that for Paul. You think about what happened with Paul. Here he is, he's in Ephesus. He didn't even go to Jerusalem originally. He heads up and he goes to Jerusalem, which is the opposite. Sorry, he didn't go to Rome originally. He ends up going to Jerusalem, which is the opposite direction. And there in Jerusalem, he gets arrested. He had a little bit of a hint that that would happen. He gets taken to a port city of Caesarea in near Jerusalem down there to be protected from the Jews who were gonna kill him. And there he is in Caesarea, and he eventually gets put on a ship. God never told him he was gonna go on a ship. He never knew that that was gonna happen. And here he is, he's going on the ship. He ends up sailing through the Mediterranean and a massive great storm comes. God never told him that a storm was gonna come. God never mentioned that. He does in the middle of that storm, tell him that he's gonna be okay and that everyone's gonna be okay and he'll end up in, will end up in Rome eventually. And then the ship has a shipwreck and he ends up in Malta. So he's going all these different directions but eventually, much longer than you might have thought, not a simple plan, plan, action, achieve the goal, but this twisting, turning journey, he does end up in Rome. But he's there in Rome, and remember, that was not his goal. His goal was to get to Spain. So there are some times in life when, yes, even though we persevere, and even though we continue through all the twists and turns of our life, journey, we still do not end up in the place. And it's more like this particular diagram. We go this way, we go that way, we go this way. There's twists and turns and twists and turns and twists and turns. And in the end, we discover not that we end up at that goal, but we end up in an entirely different place at another goal, which we never dreamed of and we never thought would happen. How do we adjust to that? What do we do in those particular circumstances? happened to Paul, but in reality, it happened to many, many different people in the Bible. In fact, maybe sometimes this is a more normal pattern than we actually think. You remember Peter, when Jesus called Peter, he said to them, I'm gonna make you a fisher of men or a fisher of people. But what actually happens? Well, from that point on, Jesus never talks about being fishermen ever again goes through a whole journey with Jesus, Peter does. And on that journey with Jesus, he at one point denies Jesus. But then afterwards, Peter never goes, sorry, Jesus never goes back to talk about being a fisher of men. What does he say? You're gonna be a shepherd. I can imagine Peter there at that point saying, what, I thought I was gonna be a fisherman. But no, you're gonna be a shepherd, a shepherd, a pastor of people. I've never been a pastor before. I haven't even pastored you know, literal woolly sheep. How do I know to pass it? I can imagine that going on in Peter's mind. You see, Jesus had a different plan to what he had originally said. That was just the hook to get Peter on the journey. You can reflect on other stories in the Bible. Think about Gideon in the Old Testament. Those of you who know the story of Gideon. Here is Gideon. Gideon is in the wine press treading out the wine. In other words, he is a winemaker. Gideon is a winemaker. There's a lot of trouble going on. There's a lot of battles going on and he doesn't want to be part of that battle, but a mighty great angel appears and says to him, hey, Gideon, you mighty man of valour. He says, what, me? I'm a winemaker, not a warrior. But no, <laughs> through a series of incidents, he's eventually persuaded that God didn't call him just to be a winemaker. God actually called him to be a warrior. His plans were not God's plans for his life. You can think of Moses. Here's Moses. 
He's you know, grown up in the house of Pharaoh there and then he tries and does something and flips out a bit and kills somebody. He ends up in the wilderness and there he is. He is a shepherd. He is a shepherd pastoring sheep. He's gotten married. He's got a couple of guys there, a couple of sons. And he's enjoying life there. He sees a burning bush and God says to him, yay, ho, Moses, I'm calling you back to go back to Israel. He says, what? God says, go. He says, no. God says, go. He says, no. Or at least reluctantly, really? Is that really what you want me to do? His whole direction is turned around and called around to go back to the place of the problems that he'd encountered. There's a whole thought in that. Think about this particular example here. <laughs> this is a good one. Jonah and Nineveh. No desire at all to go to Nineveh. No, last place on earth he ever wanted to go. So he went entirely the opposite direction, off in this direction, and he encounters an enormous great problem. It happens to be a whale, a storm, a whale. He ends up in the belly of the whale. He goes and God pulls him back. He recommits himself to God and says, okay, God, I'll go to Nineveh. That wasn't my plan, but it's your plan, God. I know I'm gonna go there. And even when he's there, he's a little bit reluctant about that particular goal and that outcome. So all these examples of where people don't actually achieve the goal that they set. They don't finish what they initially intended and started, but nevertheless, they finish well. How do we deal with that? How do we address that? What do we do when that happens? Well, I wanna suggest to you that one of the ways of starting to deal with blocked goals is realising that problems can actually guide us towards our purpose. Problems can guide us towards our purpose. Let me say that again, but expand it a little bit more. Problems can actually guide us towards God's purpose for our life. And we, that doesn't mean God made the problems happen, but with a change of perspective, we can actually adapt and adjust because the problem itself might be what actually defines our purpose. So let me give you a few examples from my own life and from church life, which would illustrate this. And let me start with the, maybe the more the lighthearted one. You know, here, my wife and I, we're sitting there. We, we really wanted to go to the South Pacific. That was our plan. That was our goal. And we were literally quite angry and ticked at 6 a.m. in the morning, we, we discovered this. And we thought to ourselves, no, 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 we're just gonna go home. We can't be bothered going to Hobart. Forgive me, please, Tasmanians. But yeah, we'd been there before. You know, we'd been there quite a lot of times. It's a great place. But no, we're gonna go home and we're gonna just you know, get, take the compensation money and just have eight days at home watching the lawns grow and get... <laughs> watching the, you know, looking at all the things that needed to be done and washing our own dishes, cooking our own meal. No, and we thought about that. No, 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 no. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a holiday. And the whole purpose of this eight days away was, yes, South Pacific, that was part of the goal, but the whole purpose was in fact to have a rest. And as we thought about it and changed our perspective on it and looked at the problem, we also discovered as we read through the fine print that they're gonna pay us to go to Hobart. We are gonna be completely, have a free trip all the way to Hobart for five days in a cruise ship and enjoy that with all expenses paid because they're gonna compensate us for the full cost of the trip. And suddenly a bit of a change of attitude starts to come in here and think, <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, maybe we should look at this in a different way. The purpose of this was for us to have a rest. We could go to the South Pacific and enjoy our snorkeling another time, but does this achieve the purpose? Absolutely it does. We looked at it in that way. And yes, we had a wonderful holiday, thank you very much, and came back very refreshed and ready for the next stage of life and ministry. One example. I'll give you another example. You know, I actually thought, my wife and I, that we were called to be long-term missionaries in a foreign culture. And we studied for that. We prepared for that. We even went to another nation for two years thinking that was where God was calling us to go. But then church asked us, can you stay home and can you become the mission director of City Life Church? Whole direction changed. Wasn't part of my goal. Wasn't part of the plan, but it was part of God's plan. I'll give you another perspective on that in case you think this is all simply about you know, working for the church or working in a mission or something else like that. This, this principle 
of pausing and realising that sometimes problems can guide us towards our purpose applies in any vocational area of life if we have a heart open to God. When I was in my 30s, uh, I was working as an economic consultant in another nation and my boss, wonderful man, a very gentle and gracious man, but also very bold and forceful and quite dogmatic at times, he said to me, because I had a desire in this project to be the financial analyst. He said to me, no, Andrew, on this project, you're not going to be the financial analyst. You are going to do the social survey. What did that mean? Well, it was an irrigation project and we had to work out how to resettle and what the costs and effects would be of resettling our villages and that which were going to be flooded by this irrigation dam. I said, no way, I don't want to do that work. I want to do the financial analysis, please. I was quite grumpy about it. I actually told him what I thought. And he says, no, Andrew, <laughs> you're doing the social analysis. So I had to humbly submit and I had to say, okay, I'm going to do, I do that. And when I adapted and changed the goal, it was the most enjoyable project I think I'd ever done. <laughs> also one of the hardest in some ways, but actually connecting with people rather than just looking at numbers and finding out what the impact of this irrigation dam would be. And I really did enjoy it and look back on it and I'm thankful that I didn't do the other. So God can, in many different situations, change the goal, but it doesn't mean we won't finish well, even if we didn't finish exactly what we hoped to start. Let me give you some examples from church life. Apollos Ginny, who's our World Impact Director, our Missions Director, a number of years ago, over a decade ago, we worked with him and partnered with him to send him to Ethiopia. Do you know what we sent him to Ethiopia to do? Plant an English-speaking church because that would be a church where people from all the different cultures, all the languages would be able to come together. He never, well, he did, he started, but there was quite a lot of problems in that particular approach, bringing all the cultures together. And so rather than an English-speaking church, he ended up planting a movement of 20 now, a Romo-speaking church. That was not the original plan, but at a deeper level, was there a church planting movement which was impacting communities, cities for the Kingdom of God, nations? Yes. So he finished well when he returned and that continues on and continues to grow. Did he finish exactly what he wanted in the beginning? No. But did he finish well? Yes. I'll give you another example. And I know our tech and media team will value this and those of you watching all online. Many years ago, well, only about five years ago, actually, I said to our Team, no, we're not having online church. We are not doing online church. And so I had a different goal because being very mission-minded and wanting to be incarnational, I believe you should do things in person. What happened then? Well, a problem came along, a certain nameless problem. No, I will name it. <laughs> it was a pandemic came along and lo and behold, in one week I had to completely change my mind. We are doing online church. I'm sorry, I got it wrong. I was leading us to online church. And lo and behold, out of that problem with the change of perspective, we discovered an opportunity which has led us into a whole area of new ministry. We we're able to broadcast our church service and do online church together, have online life groups, have Zoom and all those types of things, and also have online life tracks. And that is a ministry which continues on to have an impact. And warm greetings to all of those of you who are watching online and may you continue to engage in church life and impact, impacted by the messages that are shared week by week by week. Problems sometimes help us identify and guide us towards a purpose which we might not have seen before. In fact, there's a Chinese word for crises. Anyone know what the Chinese word for crises is? I think it's in Mandarin. I'll try and pronounce it correctly. Some of you should know this. It's a, a flat tone. I think you say wei ji. Is that correct for the Mandarin speakers? Wei Ji, something like that. Anyway, it's two characters. Wei Ji means crisis, but it's actually two characters. The first character, I think it is, that one means danger. Danger. But the second character means opportunity. And within every problem, there's an opportunity to pause and reflect and discover if there's an opportunity which we hadn't considered before. So I want to consider four practices in the remaining time we have which might help us when we're in this situation of facing a problem, a blocked goal. We've got a deep conviction that we want to finish what we've started and yet it just seems impossible to do. What do we do in those circumstances? And I want to suggest the first thing to do, and I believe this reflects Paul's attitude, 
is to realise, to change that phrase, our understanding of that phrase, finishing what you started. Often we think of that as finishing what I started. But what if you change that phrase into a prayer? What do I mean by that? Instead of saying, I want to finish what I started, you say, Lord, help me to finish what you started. Lord, help me to understand what your goals, what your purposes, what your plans are, and finish what you have called me to do. Isn't that an absolute change of perspective? That was Paul's prayer. Paul, Paul had dedicated, he was going his own direction and then he got you know, confronted by that and blinded and God changed his whole direction because he wanted now to fulfil God's purposes and God's plans and the problem led to a change of direction for him. Yeah, even think about that last phrase that Paul says into Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. There's a subtlety in the phrasing of that that we need to capture. He is not saying, I have fought my fight. No, he's been engaged in God's battle. Yes, we're a warrior in God's battle, but God has angel armies. When we understand it's God's battle, not my battle, then we can actually know that God is with us and have a deeper confidence that we will finish the journey because it's God's battle. Then think about that phrase, you know, I have finished the race. He didn't say, I've finished my race. He didn't do it my way. No, he's finished the race. It's Jesus's race. Jesus has gone before us. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And there we can strengthen our knees. We can lift up our hands because it is a race that we're running with Jesus. You know, this little passage in 2 Timothy is not a Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. No, this is, we did it God's way. Think about the end, I have kept the faith. Not I've kept my faith. Yes, it's important to have faith. Our faith is important, but how much, sometimes we stumble, sometimes we fail, sometimes we're weak, sometimes we're weak in faith, but we can absolutely trust in God's faithfulness. And that's the emphasis of this phrase. I have kept the faith, the faithfulness of God in sending His Son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we could have new life and resurrection life in Him and He's faithful to His promises and what He's begun in your life, He will bring to completion because God Himself is faithful. You see, the whole emphasis is not upon my plans, but on God's plans. I can see Paul absolutely praying, Lord, I wanna finish the task, but Lord, help me to know what your plan is. Help me to finish what you have started in my life. And if you haven't called me to Spain, then I'm at peace with stopping here and finishing my part in your mission in Rome. So four practical exercises that can actually help us to make that shift when we face a problem, we face a blockage, and we're not able to achieve our goals. The first one that I want to mention here is discern the learning purpose. If your goal is blocked, then what can you learn from that? What can you learn from this particular circumstance? And one thing that can help us with that is another little practice where we change the question, not from questioning why, but rather asking the question, what? So much in life we can say, why God? Why God aren't we going to the South Pacific? Why Lord, can't I go and do some snorkeling? Lord, I've only brought my summer clothes. They're not going to work at Hobart. Why is that, God? Why, oh Lord? No, no, that's the wrong question. What? What can I adjust to make this a better journey? (laughs) What can I learn from this so I can actually, you know, even though I can't achieve the goal, what, 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 what can I apply here? What can I do differently? Go to Meyer and buy some warm clothes. Nice and easy. And suddenly Hobart is enjoyable. It's a wonderful place. So change the question why into a what. The Bible often never answers the question why, but it does tell us what we can do in following Jesus. Here's another practice that can be very helpful as we face a blockage, but it can help us to turn our problems and help see the problems as a way to guide us towards our purpose. And this is what I call discovering your shape. God's given us all, I believe, a unique shape. What do we mean by shape? We have a whole course on this. August the 10th here at Knox, you can take that course, put it in your diary, a Saturday morning. SHAPE stands for, as some of you will be aware, SHAPE is an acronym, S, your spiritual gifts, P is your passion or your heart passion, A is your abilities, 
sorry, H is your heart passion, A is your abilities, P is your personality, E is your experiences. And when we discover our shape, sometimes we discover that we are shaped for something a little bit different to what we thought. Let me give you an example of this. I was taking some people in another nation through this particular shape perspective and a young lady came up to me afterwards and she said to me, I've realised my spiritual gift is teaching, but my passion is children. My heart is for children and my experience is as a teacher in a secular school. And she said, I've suddenly realised I had thought that God was calling me to be a teacher in the church, a Bible college teacher or a preacher or a teacher. But now, now I've realised as I've identified my shape, God is forming me with a heart for children and experience as a school teacher to use my spiritual gifts in that secular environment to demonstrate and when I have the opportunities to actually proclaim the good news of Jesus, to teach people of God's ways and to show how people can live a life which leads them to Jesus. Can you see how that was a change of perspective where her shape now fitted what God had called her to do? Another principle which can be helpful to us is what I call base and phase. Base, this is a concept that comes from a gentleman called Mike Breen. A God has given us a particular basic shape, a particular basic way in which He shaped us. But there are times in life when we don't quite seem to fit or we've been given an assignment or doing a particular task which doesn't quite seem to fit our basic shape. That's what you call a phase in life. And it's important to realise that in some of those phases in life, there are still things that we can learn. There are things that we can discover, which when we come back to our base, are actually important for us to actually break through some of the problems or some of the things or some of the issues that we might encounter, even in the base that God's called us to. So let me illustrate this. You know, for a number of years, I was a song leader. I used to play the piano. I used to worship lead at City Life Church. That was a phase but it wasn't my base. That was a phase which I learned from. For uh, I wanted to be a long-term missionary in a foreign field. There was two years in which I spent time doing that, but that was a phase. It was not the base that God was shaping in my life and calling me to. Uh, there's, there's times in our life when we experience even isolation, we experience loneliness, we experience grief, and that's kind of like a phase that we go through. And there's still, we can say, why God, why God? But if we we'll turn and ask God, Lord, what, are you, what can I learn from this? What can I learn from these really difficult problems and circumstances? Then that begins to shape and form us into a person who's maybe able to move into the next phase of life and be more effective because of that. A gentleman yesterday uh, from Kenya, part of our congregation, came up to me and said, there is a Swahili word which means a problem. And that Swahili word is shida, S-H-I-D-A. You only have to add one letter to that word, the letter N, and turn that word into shinda, S-H-I-N-D-A, and that word then now means winning. I thought, what a little great insight. Sometimes there's only just one small change that needs to happen in the direction of our life or the shape that we're trying to, that God's forming us. One short, small change in our thinking, one small thing that we have to learn, which turns a trouble, a problem, a difficulty into something where we actually achieve the goal. And it's maybe just even a slight change in direction. But unless we go through a phase where we learn from the trouble and learn from the problem and learn from the difficulty, we'll never discover that new change which enables us to be more effective when we come to our basic calling that God's called us to. For me, in whatever phase of life I've been in, I always end up training and teaching. It's kind of like the base. I always come back to that. Whatever I'm doing, I come back to training and teaching. And most probably I'll continue on doing that until God takes me to be with, be with Him. Right now, I'm in a phase of life where I'm pastoring a local church and I enjoy this phase. It's great. And, but that's just for a season. What's my base? My base really is a teacher and a preacher and a trainer. I hope that helps you understand this base and phase and how it works together. And I hope you've now caught up a few practical clues which can help you as you maybe face a blockage and are not quite sure how to deal with the fact that you cannot achieve your goal. I wanna finish with one last life lesson. One last life lesson. You got a little bit more time here? 
Yeah, good. One last life lesson which can be helpful as we look at this. And that is, enjoy grandparenting. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Enjoy grandparenting. You know, sometimes God gives us a heart and a passion for something, but it's not for us. It's for someone else. It's for the next generation. It's for the person that we pass on to. We're in a race in which you pass on the baton. We're in a race. The race is God's race. The mission is God's mission. The purposes are God's purposes. And sometimes He puts something in our heart which is not for us to fulfil, but He wants us to pass it on to others. And so there's a passing of the baton. And not only a passing of the baton to the next generation, but to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation. That's what I call grandparenting. Having a heart not just for one generation, but for the generations that follow. Now you just think about Paul. Here is Paul. This was one of his life lessons. You can see it in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. He, had a, he enjoyed grandparenting. He, he had a grandparent's heart. And whatever age you're at, you can take this principle. You know, you can be a young person. You can abide and learn from this principle. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. What does it say? And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach Others. Notice two generations there. The things you've heard from me and trust to reliable people, second generation, who will be able to teach others also. Third generation. That's good grandparenting. And you can, you can start doing that at any stage of life. This is a great life lesson. Think about Paul. Paul never got to Spain. But in generations to come, in generations to come, the message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ went to Spain and the nation of Spain was deeply, deeply and has been deeply, deeply influenced by that message. It's the same message that Paul preached. It didn't happen in his generation, but as he passed it on and others passed it on, it did happen. Because ultimately it's God's mission, it's God's purposes, and it's God's plans. We simply need to align our plans with His. Whether that means we achieve our goals or whether there's a change and it's different to what we thought, we can always finish well. Why don't you stand? I'm gonna pray a prayer. And for those of you who may be facing very challenging situations and you're not, you're, it's a blocked goal, you're not quite sure how to work this out, join with me as I pray this prayer. You join me with your heart. I'll say the words, but you join me with me in your heart as we pray. Oh Lord God, when you give your servants any great matter to undertake, grant us also a deep, deep heart conviction this is Sir Francis Drake's prayer, by the way, with a few additions that I've added in. Grant us also a deep heart conviction that is not the beginning which yields the true glory, but the continuation in the endeavour until it's thoroughly finished. Lord, give us strength to finish what You started and to finish well. And when we encounter problems, guide us towards Your purposes for our life so that we might be able to say with Paul that we have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith, through Him who laid down His life for us to finish Your work, Lord, our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, City Life Church. My prayer is for each one of us that will finish what you started, Lord.
Yeah.